We have a quorum. I now call to order the meeting of the Board of Education of Baltimore County for Tuesday, March 19th, 2019. I invite you to rise and recite the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag to be led by Rumbi Magwendi. We will then remain standing for a moment of silence in recognition of those who have served education in Baltimore County. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America and to the republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, with liberty, liberty and justice for all. Thank you, and that was one of our students from Western School of Technology and Environmental Science. Our first item is the consideration of the March 19, 2019 agenda. Ms. White, are there any additions or changes to tonight's agenda? There are no additions or changes. Thank you. Yes. An item for discussion on the external audit prior to uh, and add it prior to uh, item E, public comment, so that we can talk about this. Point of order. Ms. The Rob. external audit's in committee. As long as something's in committee, it can't be on the agenda. It has to stay in committee until the committee of the whole finishes its work. I would concur with Ms. Rowe's point of order. That well, that I, th is I think the committee. board can do whatever it would like. And if the board makes a decision to do this, it's the board's decision. Uh, so if the board makes a decision to move this forward, and I think it's imperative to move this forward based on all the comments we've gotten from the community. So I'm I happy to read the corresponding rules out of Robert Jules' order. Um, <clears throat> Ms. Rowe, go ahead. One moment, let me make sure I'm reading the right one. An affirmative vote on the motion to commit can be reconsidered if the committee has not begun consideration of the question. All right, hang on, let me get, yeah, that's the beginning, okay. Thereafter, if the assembly wishes to take the question out of the hands of the committee, the motion to discharge committee must be used. A negative vote on the motion to commit can be reconsidered only until such time as progress in business or debate has been sufficient to make it essentially a new question. Thereafter, the motion can be reviewed, and I'd, um, that is page 171. And basically what this means is that if an item has been referred by the board to committee, then that item has to stay in committee unless the committee is discharged. And currently the, the external audit is in a committee of the whole, which means it cannot be discussed in the full board. And additionally, in order for us to add it to the agenda, we would then have to go into closed session, which I think is probably not desirable by this board. My ruling is that it is out of order and so it will not be considered. Are we there have any other, other questions here? Excuse Mr. me? Mr. Nussbaum, do you, you have other um, questions? I would like to ask Mr. Nussbaum the question because the external ad hoc committee has been disbanded by the board. So we are operating as a committee as a whole and if the board wants to add an agenda item, I don't see why not or what the resistance is. It's, this is to address to the people in keeping up the transparency and I think everybody should see what's going on here. Thank you. Thank you. First of all, the um, 
it is the role of the presider to determine what's in order and what's out of order. Um, so I've determined that it's out of order based on what I have read in page 171, if the main question is to be considered in a committee of the whole or if it is to be considered informally. So are there any other items to add to the agenda? Hearing none, the agenda stands as presented. Earlier this evening, the board met in closed session pursuant to the Opens Meetings Act for the following reasons. To discuss one, the appointment, employment, assignment, promotion, discipline, demotion, compensation, removal, resignation, or performance evaluation of appointees, employees, or officials over whom it has jurisdiction, or any other personnel matter that affects one or more specific individuals. And seven, consult with counsel to obtain legal advice. The minutes of the closed session and informational summary can be found on our website at www.bcps.org slash board slash informational dash summaries dot html. Our next item is D, selection of speakers. Sign-up cards were available to the public prior to the meeting for anyone wishing to speak at this evening's meeting. Board practice limits to 10 the number of speakers at a regularly scheduled board meeting. Each speaker is allowed three minutes to address the board. The completed sign-up cards for this evening have been placed in this box, and the first 10 drawn from the box will be our speakers for tonight during the public portion of the meeting. Of course, if fewer than 10 sign-up cards are received, all who sign up will be permitted to speak. Our first speaker tonight is Alicia Curry. Our second speaker is Veronica, and I'm, I apologize for getting the pronunciation wrong, looking Nyeko, Nyeko? Our third um, speaker tonight is John Liu. Our fourth speaker is Francis Jin. Our fifth speaker is Jin Hu Yin. Our sixth speaker is Sue Battle McDonald. Our seventh speaker is Ping Wu Zhang. Our eighth speaker is Deb Sullivan. Our ninth speaker is Dr. Bosch Ferrone. And our tenth speaker is Zhu Zong Zhang. And I apologize for the pronunciations. I know I murdered those. Thank you. Our next item is public comment. <coughs> This is one of the opportunities the board provides to hear the views and receive the advice of community members. The members of the board appreciate hearing from interested citizens. As appropriate, we will refer your concerns to the interim superintendent for follow-up by her staff. While we encourage public input on policies, programs, and practices within the purview of this board and this school system, this is not the proper forum to address specific student or employee matters or to comment on matters that do not relate to public education in Baltimore County. We encourage everyone to utilize existing dispute resolution processes as appropriate. I remind everyone that inappropriate personal remarks or other behavior that disrupts or interferes with the conduct of this meeting are out of order. I ask you to observe the three minute clock, which will let you know when your time is up. Please conclude your remarks when you hear the bell or see that time has expired. The microphone will be turned off at the end of your time, and it could be turned off if a speaker addresses specific student or employee matters or is commenting on matters not related to public education in Baltimore County. I now call our advisory groups to speak. First this evening, we have from the Baltimore County Student Council, President Ruben Amaya. Good evening. Good evening. Last Tuesday, BCSE held its March General Assembly with student councils from all over the county. In this event, we discussed various initiatives, growing in leadership skills, and finding improvements to the challenges students face. 
Next week, BCSC will be attending the Maryland Association of Student Council State Convention at Ocean City. We will be bringing one of the largest delegations with over 123 students with 19 schools represented. We are excited for all the work our student councils have done this year, and convention is a great way to wrap up the amazing work we've all done. Today, BCSC had the honor of welcoming the Bedford Elementary SGA here at Greenwood, we, where we discussed advocacy and leadership. Thank you to Mrs. White for surprising them today. Their reaction was priceless, and I'm sure it will be a moment they will cherish for a very long time. Truly, it was an inspiration hearing from them today. Seeing the perspective of, of elementary students was a fresh take on leadership and the future, which I can say will be a very bright one. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker for this evening is from TABCO, President Abby Baton. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Han, Ms. White, and members of the board. Thank you all for the, those of you who were able to take the time out of your busy schedules to attend our rally in Annapolis. I did uh, see Chairwoman Causey come in on a bike. <laughs> um, the estimated number of attendees was 8,500 people. Baltimore County was in the house. Your support is critical. We are holding another rally on April 1st in front of the county courthouse. We hope you will join us there as well as we continue the fight for our schools and most especially for our students. On another note, we appreciate the opportunity to provide feedback on the superintendent's search. However, we feel the time frame of just three days with not even a full week's notice is woefully inadequate. This board has been in place since December and had decided early on that a superintendent search was necessary for our school system. While we have no problem with the superintendent search being launched, we have grave concerns over the real value of some rushed 45-minute sessions and a few open forums tomorrow through Friday. Even the survey must be completed in a short amount of time. Because of the rust na rushed nature of this feedback schedule, we wonder how useful or reflective of the community and staff it will be. One wonders if this is just being used as a way to claim the stakeholders have had the opportunity to provide input. The fact is that a true opportunity would have taken a much longer measured approach. Why was so much time wasted before this input was sought? Thank you for your time. Thank you. And our next speaker is Kiria Joseph from the Baltimore County Alliance of Black School Educators. Good evening and welcome. Good evening, Board Chair Kathleen Causey, Board Vice Chair Julie Hen, Superintendent Verlita White, and Board Members. Uh, my name is Kiria Joseph and I am the President of the Baltimore County Alliance of Black School Educators, fondly known as PCAFSI. Our members include teachers, front office staff, administrators, paraeducators, building service staff, retired staff, parents, and students. The purpose of this organization is to create and provide a network of communication for educators, particularly educators of color in Baltimore County, to enhance the skills and capabilities of educators for improving the quality of education for all children and students, particularly children and students of color to provide a forum for disseminating information on trends and issues concerning the education of children of color, and to facilitate the resolution of commonly perceived problems. According to the 2019 Baltimore County School data, 62% of our students are considered students of color. 62% is approximately 71,000 students. Baltimore County school students represent 115 countries and 97 languages. But CAPSI is a part of the National Alliance of Black School Educators, and we have been charged to focus on national programming priorities, which include the improvement of student achievement, leadership and development and career advancement, educator recognition, and legislative involvement and advocacy. Would the members of the Baltimore County Alliance of Black School Educators please stand? We leave you with this quote from Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. 
Our lives begin to end the day we become silent about things that matter. We thank you for this opportunity, and we hope to work collaboratively with the Board of Education in order to provide a world-class education for our students. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Mr. Michael Fahey from AFSME. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Cozzi and Vice Chair Han and Superintendent White and members of the board. Um, I just wanted to talk about the um, contract award tonight, number four, for the um, <coughs> field trip transportation services. Um, it's for $10 million and the contract the current contract is not due to expire until June 20, 2021. Uh, so it says the average annual expenditures were 1243000 and the total contract expenditures $9.9 which would, I calculate that to be eight years. Um, <clears throat> They're going to say that they have to do this because of lack of um, school bus drivers. Uh, I'd just like to point out that it's been more than two years since you've advertised for full-time bus driver. The um, ad on your uh, website is for trainee bus driver part-time. And it's been more than two years since you've ad for, advertised for bus drivers. If you don't ad for drive bus, if you don't advertise for bus drivers, you're not going to have any. It's, it's so it seems that transportation, who going through a little mini Brexit of their own, have decided that um, they want to contract all our jobs out. Um, I think if you're putting ten million dollars to contractors, that they should have contacted the um, representative of the bargaining unit. I was never consulted about this. Uh, maybe this $10 million might be an incentive to hire bus drivers. You could give them overtime because a lot of it is weekend and late night. Um, I think since there's two years to run on the existing contract, I would ask that the board uh, not make a decision on this tonight and uh, postpone it till a later time. Thank you. Thank you. And from Southeast Area Education Advisory Council, we have Ms. Sandra Scordelos. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman. Causey, Vice Chair Hen, and Superintendent White, and all the other board members. I'm here this evening to be proactive regarding the school capacity report that you will see this evening. As you probably know, Dundalk High School has several trailers and portable classrooms. Sparrows Point currently houses a middle school, a high school from 1956. A replacement school or schools is necessary to address the aging facility issues and the increase in current and projected enrollment. And at Patapsco High School, although we are pleased with the renovations that we are currently receiving, they do not address the fact that we have had anywhere from nine to 25 trailers or portable classrooms for over at least 24 years that I've been at Patapsco High School. It's the second or at most times the most that's ever been in, these, uh, in any school in Baltimore County. We currently have the mechanical, electrical, plumbing, and infrastructure and space to expand the scope of work to address the overcrowding immediately following our renovation. With this infrastructure in place, the cost for additions to our space would not come at, great, at a great cost. Yet in the high school capacity study, the presentation that I read through today, the issues of, for the Southeast is relegated to one statement. The Southeast area has a seat deficit now and will have the largest seat deficit in the future. Under a statement that says, competing needs for schools and improvements, competing needs for schools and improvements, which seems, in my opinion, to pit us against the central area projects. At least that's the way it reads to me. And to address their growing crowding and over, their overcrowding and their concern with seats in the Northeast. 
This seems to be expressed and with the, this lack of urgency for the Southeast area, especially in the fact that for the current and past 24 years, we have had overcrowding in the Southeast. And though I know that this is a first report, the Southeast Area Educational Advisory Council is asking for you on behalf of our community to, to address this issue with some urgency. I've been on the Southeast Area Advisory Council for close to 20 years. We've been speaking to this board as often as possible, although we always hear that Patapsco never comes to the table. We need you to be considering us. We're not even mentioned in the report. So thank you for your time. Thank you. Our final stakeholder um, representative before we get to public comment is Lisa McClellan, representing State Delegate Michelle Guyton. Good evening. Good evening, Chair Causey. Vice Chair Hen and Superintendent White and board members. Um, I do work for State Delegate Michelle Guyton, but I'm actually here representing the joint delegations of um, District 42B and also District 11. Um, they have written a letter to you, which I am going to now read for you. Dear Chair Causey and members of the board, we are writing to express our strong support for replacement school for Delaney High School. Our community deserves a facility that matches the equality of education provided by the teachers and administration. As has been made apparent by the persistent efforts of Delaney parents, schools officials, community members, the current Delaney High School building is in poor condition, systemically and structurally due to age and neglect. For example, the school struggles with perpetual brown water, bursting pipes, lack of air conditioning, and a crumbling foundation. Furthermore, it is not designed to handle the projected enrollment in future years, and Delaney currently has the largest deficit of space of any school in Baltimore County. In fact, the past school board acknowledged that Delaney's facilities do not provide an adequate or safe learning environment. Structural deficits of the 1999 edition, in addition to the aforementioned space deficits in the original building, make renovation costs prohibitive. A new building is more cost efficient, would address future overcrowding, and would provide common areas that are within the state rated capacity. The Delaney campus is large enough for, to allow for a new building to be built with the existing building in place, allowing a new facility to be built without programming concerns. Since a new Delaney High School would address overcrowding issues in our near future, as well as the inadequacies of the structure itself, we ask that planning money for a new Delaney High School be made a priority. We are optimistic that pending legislation will greatly assist Baltimore County school construction needs, bringing badly needed state resources in support of the county school for our future program. Specifically, there are two bills that would fund public school construction throughout the state. Both Governor Hogan's bill, the Building Opportunity Act of 2019, Senate Bill 159, and Delegate Dumais' bill, the Build to Learn Act of 2019, House Bill 727, are nearly identical and call for the state to borrow up to $1.8 billion, backed by $125 million in interest payments each year. Such money is to be derived from state lottery revenues. Furthermore, the bills provide for 18.2% of the loan proceeds, or $327 million, to be made available to Baltimore County for school construction. We thank you for the important work that you do on behalf of the Baltimore County public school systems, and we look forward to working together to build a new Delaney High School. Sincerely, from District 42, Senator Chris West, Delegate Michelle Guyton, and Delegate Nino Mangione. And from District 11, Senator Bobby Zirkin, Delegate John Carden, Delegate Shelley Hedelman, and Delegate Dana Stein. Thank you. Thank you. And now for our public comment from individuals, and our first speaker is Alicia Curie. Good evening. Good evening, Chairwoman Kazi, Vice Chair Hinn, members of the board, and Interim Superintendent White. My name is Alicia Curry, and I'm a proud parent of two girls at Pleasant Plains Elementary School and a member of the school's PTA. I first want to address some issues related to staffing projections and what some of our staffing needs are at Pleasant Plains. 
You heard about our need for two full-time guidance counselors. I'd also like to make a case for an additional 10-month clerical position. As a Title I school of over 700 students, our amazing clerical staff need some support. They have more intake and transfer paperwork to fill out than a non-Title I school, for example. I'd like to talk for a minute about enrollment projections. As you've heard from us previously, the BCPS projections are very different from our actual enrollment. There needs to be a procedure in place so that projections can be compared to actual enrollment data at each school, so adjustments can be made for the next school year. The current method of calculating enrollment projections does not account for changing demographics of surrounding neighborhoods. My neighborhood of Lock Raven Village, for example, is about 60 years old, and we are seeing a growing number of young families with children moving in while older original owners are moving out. When decisions are made based on aggregate data from an entire geographic planning zone, outliers such as Ple uh, Pleasant Plains are easily overlooked. BCPS needs a thorough and transparent <coughs> facilities master plan with targeted timelines and priorities for capital projects at all schools. The county currently uses enrollment as of September 30th to allocate staffing for the next year. If principals aren't given their initial staffing allotments until February, surely the date could be pushed back to reflect more current enrollment at schools. Pleasant Plains routinely has a large number of students enrolling after September 30th. Um, in addition, um, as you know, Pleasant Plains uh, was built in the 50s, and the last um, addition was done to the school in the 70s. Uh, Pleasant Plains Elementary is the third largest Title I school in the county, and based on current data, uh, Pleasant Plains is currently at 138% capacity, the highest of any elementary school in the central area. We currently have about 700 students, which is almost 200 above the capacity level of the building. Our 700 students share three sets of outdated restrooms, and our cafeteria is so small that students start eating lunch at 10.30, and some don't eat lunch until at 1.30. Um, so some are eating towards the start of the day, right after breakfast, and then have to go the whole day. And I don't know of many adults who could do that. Um, our hallways are too narrow, our classrooms are too few and too full, especially for the unique challenges that teachers at a Title I school face. Um, I get very concerned that many of these wonderful teachers at the school will burn out quickly. The entire situation is unfair for students and teachers, and frankly, it's unsafe to have a school this overcrowded. A solution for the building, whether a renovation or a new school, needs to be slated now, because who knows how over capacity the current building will be by the time a major project is completed. Thank you for your time, and we'd like to invite you out to our school. Uh, come at 10.30 for brunch with our, our first students in line. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Our next speaker is Veronica Lukian Enko. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Thank you for letting me come up here and speak today. My name is Veronica, and I'm a part of Ridgely Middle School's SGA. I'm here to speak to you about the student voice. I think that the student voice is very important because students can know that their opinions have been acknowledged and their problems or concerns looked into. With student voice, all opinions are first person and clear, based on personal experience and not simply vague observation. At my school, Ridgely Middle, we have many opportunities to reach out and be heard. However, other schools may have less of these opportunities. The student member of the board communicates with these kids and voices their ideas and problems to be addressed. For many people, this mob may be the only student voice that they have, so it is very important to keep the selection process with as much student involvement as possible because we want everyone's voice to be heard and for students to trust that their ideas are not simply being ignored. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Yan Liu. Good evening, Mr. Liu. Uh, good evening, everyone. Uh, first of all, thank you for the opportunity to talk. So I'm a, a proud parent of a BCPA student. My son is attending uh, Delaney High School. So uh, I'm here to support a nationwide search for a superintendent because we believe that uh, you know, the best uh, candidate is, is needed for our student. And uh, we, we believe that nationwide search will uh, get us most qualified candidate. So for the best benefit for our students, I think it's necessary. Uh, so here I'd like to brief uh, describe what uh, we expect of the uh, future superintendent. 
So uh, the person needed to be uh, sincere and uh, open because uh, as a parent, I also hear from my son, you know, just uh, um, recognize this uh, problem, just reported by the previous. So, so. And uh, there's a lot of problems in the, in the uh, high school and in the community. And now I also heard like uh, the bus, uh, school bus problem. Uh, I just heard that there's a lack of a uh, bus driver. And I think one of the reasons that I heard a story, uh, bus driver, a uh, student on the, bus uh, on the school bus or even school bus driver were bullied by some students. And we think they need to be um, um, disciplined. So uh, we really need a, a superintendent to be, you know, to be um, effective in dealing with this kind of problems. And uh, the superintendent needs to be uh, open so he or she can communicate with parents, with students, with the, uh, all the parts which are involved in the problem so we get the problem solved. So um, also, uh, he or she needs to be honest with the problem, to recognize the problem, not to cover it up, and no one get things done. So um, again, thank you for the opportunity. Um, thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Francis Jin. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. My name is Francis Jin. I'm from president of Baltimore County Public School System. I actually have two kids in the system, one in high school, one in uh, elementary school. Uh, today I'm here to discuss my point that we, we, I support also nationwide superintendent search. I think there should be three basic requirements for the superintendent. The first one is integrity. Uh, look at what happened the past few days to board of education here, both in the Baltimore County, but also to other local government officials. We probably agree that integrity should be the number one quality above everything else. So I think that person should, the candidate should have the highest ethical standards. Mm -hmm. The second requirement I think is passion. That person should love the school system. You should love students. You should love teachers. You should love the staff members, administrators to do your job well. You have to put in heart into it to make sure Baltimore County school system is a success, not a failure. So that's the number two requirement. And the last one, but not the least one requirement, is common sense. I mean, look at here, we have all different people here. We all grew up for in a different environment. We come maybe from different regions or countries. We speak different languages. But we were grown up, we grew up, right, in a setting, in a school, that requested us to get all the natural trainings, to learn all the skills, to prepare for the competition we grow up. Today's students are no exception. They are required to master all the skills that are necessary for them to be successful in tomorrow's markets. So I think that's just common sense. And then at school, teachers sh should be encouraged to teach all this stuff based on what is required, what is good for the student grow up. And the students should be also treated based on what they have learned, their behaviors. So good behaviors should be awarded, rewarded, right, be encouraged. Bad behavior should be punished, no exception. When you go to any, when you work for any employer, like private employers, government, and uh, that same thing. You, you should be responsible, you should be held accountable for your behavior, common sense. So in summary, I think the next candidate should have the basic three qualities, integrity, passion, common sense. And I think Baltimore County Public School should also be transparent, open, and to incorporate all the views from all the stakeholders. Thank you so much. Thank you. Our, ne our next speaker is Ms. Sue Battle McDonald. Oh, excuse me, Mr. Jin Hu Yin. Good evening. Good, good evening, everybody. I'm um, 
Hi, student. I'm a student. Uh, I'm, my name is Jin Hu Yin. Uh, I am a high student. Uh, I'm parents of a half student from Dulani High. I come here to support for uh, <coughs> to support a national wide wide superintendent search. I wish for a best candidate to turn out from the national search because this is have a, a more opportunity to find the best superintendent for our Baltimore County. Baltimore County public system, public school system. So like uh, the previous uh, uh, speakers did, I hope that um, the, who can run, uh, the, the search of the superintendent who can run Baltimore County public school in an honest, fair, and transparent way that can promote law and uh, order and encourage for good behavior and be, judge all the students depend on the behavior, their hard work, their, 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 their effort they put it in. And also that, I also that the super unit can have a patient and take a, a and face all the, all the problem that uh, fits all the problem and step, uh, take up step by step to, fi to fix all these problems, such as the bus problem, such as the uh, school um, facilities problem, and, the, and also I realized that <coughs> when, uh, when our, during the summer, there are some, stu some classrooms still don't have the air condition, I think that we also should be real assessing and not like the closer school for the, for the hot weather. So I also, <coughs> I come here, <coughs> in one word, I come here to support a nationwide superintendent search. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. Thank you. And our next speaker is Ms. Sue Battle McDonald. Good evening. Good evening. I'm the president of the Delaney High School PTSA. I'm also a founding member of Friends of Delaney and a longtime county education advocate. I'm here tonight to review some key facts about Delaney and to be sure you're aware of how urgently Delaney, Lansdowne, and the handful of other schools who will be without air conditioning for years to come need window units ASAP this spring to keep their classrooms open and usable. Here are a few points about Delaney. Delaney was built in 1964 and is in poor condition systemically, structurally, and cosmetically due to age and neglect. Delaney's MEP score in the 2014 BCPS system-wide system site assessment was the second lowest of any high school. Almost one-third of the current school was added in 1999. This addition is now itself in need of systemic renovation. Significant settlement has compromised its structure. The scope of repairs needed was beyond the cost restriction set in the 2016 feasibility study, as the study itself noted. Our original 1964 sections, again more than two-thirds of the school, lack air conditioning, and the tap water there is noticeably brown. The 1999 edition is air conditioned, but unfortunately the edition compromised airflow and quality in the original parts of the building by eliminating windows and doors. Delaney is currently over capacity and the problem is projected to worsen. We currently have a deficit of 47,000 square feet according to the MSDE formula. This is the largest space deficit of any county school. Delaney is increasingly ethnically and economically diverse. More than 800 of our students identify as non-white or biracial and about 340 of our students receive free or reduced price meals. Parents have advocated for the past five years for a new building to provide relief from brown water, flooding from weekly burst pipes, antiquated facilities, unsafe fields, etc. The idea of renovating Delaney was carefully considered and rejected as non-cost effective. At $302 per square foot, the FY19 state construction cost, it would cost $94 million to renovate Delaney. This does not make economic sense. 
A limited re renovation proposed in 2016 was rejected because it did not address the structural deficits, the projected future overcrowding, the inadequate common areas, the need to repair and expand fields and parking areas, and other problems. Of the three schools cited for replacement in the county capital request, Delaney has the highest site score, meaning building a replacement school there will be relatively feasible with limited challenges. For all those reasons, a new school is needed to allow Delaney to provide a safe, adequate, energy efficient 21st century learning environment for its diverse student population. Finally and most urgently, since new schools are years away, we very much hope that planning and procurements are already underway to provide window units for Delaney and for the small group of other schools that are still without air conditioning before the late spring heat arrives. Thank you. Thank you. Our next speaker is Ping Wu Zhang. Good evening. Good evening. Good evening, everyone. Uh, my name is Ping Wu Zhang, and uh, my second son right now, he is a high school student, is a sophomore. Uh, I'm here and uh, to strongly support to a national search for a new superintendent. And also, I want to explain why. Before I came here tonight, I did a little bit of research. I checked the US news and report. They have a whole national ranking of high school. Then we know, OK, Baltimore pretty good. OK, we number one, like a thousand high school. Number three, Delaney High School. Both they are very nice high school. But when I look at their data, I'm not happy. Why? Because their mathematical proficiency is very low. High, uh, thousand high is 6%. That means it's 6% to so reach the standard requirement. Delaney High, 8%. Meanwhile, what other people do? Like the national wide, the number one is the Western Churchill. They have 55% of students can pass the, can pass the mathematical efficiency. One is 6%, one is 55%. It's really a big gap. And I compared to the whole county. I compared to the 24 different high schools public in Baltimore County and with our neighbor, Howard County. What's the situation? Our overall, the mathematical proficiency average only 5.5%. What about the Howard County? They are 29%. Our neighbors, they are lowest is 8%. The lowest high school in whole Howard County is better than our number one school, Thousand High. So that situation, I'm not happy. Because every student, they use their time, they come to school every day, and they spend one, more than 183 days every year. Why is their performance not that as satisfied as we expected? So this situation should be changed. The meanwhile, the reading profession is relatively good. So the gap between Baltimore County public school and the Harvard County school is not that huge. So I strongly support we need a new superintendent to change that. We need a new person to lead a new direction for Baltimore County public school. Then our kids have a brighter future, and they will be more confident and more competitive in the future their life. Thank you. Thank you for your patience. Thank you. Our next speaker is Deb Sullivan. Good evening. I'm here to ask the board to please give serious consideration to the candidates who will be selected for the position of superintendent through the search process. This process will allow the board to vote for the most qualified person to lead Baltimore County Public Schools. We need a qualified person to get our county schools out of the dark hole that they have been in since the Dr. Dance scandal. Our schools have been existing in this shadow, and Ms. White, I'm sorry to say, has been 
serving in that shadow as well. We need to rise above this, and this process will allow for the most qualified of candidates to rise to the top of the pool of the candidates, Ms. White included. This process will also allow for the fair evaluation of qualified individuals and transparency as to their background, their experiences, hopefully in the classroom setting at some point, and let the, their records show what they can bring to the table to serve our precious school system. Our students deserve this, our teachers deserve this, our support staff deserves this, our communities deserve this, and the school board, you deserve this. We deserve a superintendent that can best serve our schools. We need the right person with the right experiences and the right qualifications to serve. I'm asking the board to please vote for the most qualified candidate for this job. Please consider the condition that our schools are currently in. Be honest with yourself. Listen to the community. No rose-colored glasses here. Every student could be your child or your grandchild. I served the systems three times over PTA president on all three levels. And I've served as Title I paid parent helper for many years, and I volunteered for over 20 years in this system. It sickens me that children do not feel safe. It sickens me that staff members, bus drivers, and teachers do not feel safe and that there are crimes occurring within our school buildings. It's disheartening that I know more families choosing private schools than public schools today. We need to get ourselves back on track and we need strong independent leadership who listens to all players and considers what is at stake. We do not need to continue in the shadow of a scandal. It's not fair to anyone. It's not fair to you. It's not fair to Ms. White. It's not fair to the students. Please strive for the best superintendent. You can do this. I have faith in all of you. Keep him. Our next speaker this evening is Dr. Bosch Verone. Good evening. Uh, good evening to all. Thank you for the privilege. On March 5, 2019, only three board members out of 13 spoke about the non coma or holidays in the school calendar 2019-20. 25 years of near silence on this issue. I would say free speech is not free. If we don't use it, we lose it. Governor Harry Hughes stood for clean government. Today we read about Mayor Pews and Senator Kelly on the board of University of Maryland and how they benefited from being there. Perhaps that's legal, but certainly it is corruption in government. Mm -hmm. In this school system, a small minority had the power and the privilege for 25 years to enter from the side door. And that small minority had the ears of the school system. And the school system responded by closing on their religious non kumar holidays without any true secular justification. It is really a special perk for those who are connected and everybody else just stand out and watch. There is a national movement to deprive Muslims of their rights to live in liberty and justice for all by denying the right for equity, equality, also by denying as what happened in the school calendar, which at this time, it really teaches not really love for others. It teaches just really priority of some people. I want to remind myself and remind you of President Reagan. He stood in front of the Statue of Liberty in 1980 and he said, these families came here to work. 
They came here to build. Others came to America in different ways from other lands, and they're different and often harrowing conditions. But this place symbolizes what they all managed to build, no matter where they came from or how they came or how much they suffered. I know this is time for the new calendar. I really ask you to consider diversity. Diversity has to mean diversity. Thank you. Thank you. And our final speaker is Zhu Song Zhang. Good evening. Good evening. Um, I need to find uh, my transcription. My name is Xue Song Jiang, and uh, my son attended this school system since he was third grade. Uh, what I was uh, most worried about him is the uh, implementation of the causes tracking system. Uh, we were uh, uh, actually we are a, a still immigrants, new immigrants to, to this state, um, and we and he he didn't speak English at, uh, very well during that time. Originally, he took standard classes, but he loved the language and was able to satisfy his uh, academic uh, aspirations and uh, move on to the uh, GTE and AP uh, courses. So I believe the Im implementation, I implementation of the tracking system is inherently flawed and prevent our children from achieving their fullest potential. Uh, that's why I think uh, uh, searching for an, a new uh, superintendent uh, through the nation, uh, nation, national uh, search um, is very important. So that's our children and uh, can continue to reach higher standard of uh, academic knowledge. Thank you. Thank you, that concludes our public speaker portion. Our next item of business is item F, new business, personnel matters, and for that I call forward Dr. Mayo. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chairwoman Hinn, Superintendent White, members of the board. I'd like board consent for the following personnel matters, retirements, resignations, and Area Education Advisory Council appointment. Do I have a motion to approve the personnel matters as presented in exhibits F1 through F3? Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Do I have a second? Second. Is there any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Mayo. Our next item of business is item G, new business, action taken in closed session. And for that, I call on Mr. Nussbaum. Good evening. Earlier this evening, the board considered an appeal regarding a confidential student matter in your quasi-judicial capacity. The matter was heard in oral argument where the board heard from the parties. At this time, it would be appropriate to confirm the action taken in that closed session in that matter, which was oral argument, uh, or hearing, excuse me, hearing examiner number 19-19. Do I have a motion to approve the action taken in closed session? So moved. Thank you, Ms. Mack. Do I have a second? Second. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Any discussion? All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you, and the order's on the desk for signing. Thank you. And Ms. Gover, there were two that were not present for. Thank you. Our next item of business is item H, new business, contract awards, and for that I call on Ms. Hen. Thank you. 
Members of the board, the board's building and contracts committee met earlier this evening. Items H1 through H9 are being forwarded to the full board for approval. Is there, um, Ms. Hen, I would ask you to pull out the um, contract related to transportation. It would have been H4. Yes, I believe it was item four for discussion. Does anyone else want to separate any contracts before we? <coughs> okay, thank you. Do I have a motion to accept items? Or do you want to? Do you want to make your motion? Um, do I have a motion to accept items one through four and one through three and five through nine? Excuse me. Items one through three and five through nine. <coughs> Is there a motion? Thank you, Ms. Rowe. Thank you, Mr. Offerman. Is there any discussion on those items? Any questions? All those in favor, please raise your hand. <coughs> Thank you. Any opposed? That motion carries. If we could have staff come up for uh, to discuss item four. Good evening, Mr. Saris, Mr. Good West. Good evening. Good evening. If you could go through, I know the Building and Contracts Committee met earlier this evening, um, but not all board members had an opportunity to attend that as it would immediately preceded our other meetings. If you could go through this contract, I had questions um, ahead of the comments that we heard, but those brought additional questions. So if you could just go through the summary. Yeah, uh, so this is a new competitively bid contract for field trip transportation services for the Office of Transportation. Approval is requested for a five-year contract with 15 recommended bidders and contract spending authority of $10 million. And I can just add that the original 2011 contract uh, provided only eight bidders as opposed to the 15 that we uh, have uh, recommended here and during the intervening time since that uh, that contract extension was exercised in 2016 a number of those providers are no longer uh, working or viable or certified or available to us for some other reason and so I can say that from the procurement standpoint we rebid this contract to uh, both refresh the pricing and to gain a wider variety of resources uh, that could be uh, drawn upon. Thank you. And one of the questions that I had from earlier is the um, annual amount and what is the cost difference? So for instance, the average annual expenditures on contract uh, PCR were 20411, were 1,243,000 and change. Um, over the last, is that over the last That's eight, 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 eight correct, years? Eight years, yes. Okay, so the total over eight years was 9,947. Correct. So this contract is for five years. So the annual, so what you're expecting annually or allowing this spending authority for is two million a year? Correct, that's our rest projection at this time. And what is the reason for doubling the spending authority per year? Uh, I don't think it's technically doubling, but it is a significant increase um, and uh, Mr. West, if you have any comments. Sure. We do know that um, there has been an increase in certain field trips that, are, that have been requested um, throughout the school system, and that also includes the athletic area. Um, so we want to make sure that we don't go over this, the, the spending authority um, and we allow an appropriate amount at the contract approval. So I believe that was our estimate for approximately two million per year. And I heard conversation about the 
um, cost difference of um, the Baltimore County Public Schools transportation cost per mile. Yes, ma'am. And this cost per mile, but I wasn't sh I, I wasn't clear on the answer. So if you could expand on that. So this contract allows the bidders to bid um, in two fashions. The first is a cost per mile and a cost per hour, and also a flat rate. So if we're comparing cost per hour and cost per mile, then generally speaking, Baltimore County school buses will be cheaper. However, there are certain field trips that we are unable to do. For example, many, many field trips are taken during times when we're transporting students to and from school. And of course, that is our first priority. So therefore, if a field trip starts while we're in the midst of transporting or ends in the, while we're in the midst of transporting, we therefore are, are not able to provide that service to schools. Secondarily, there are field trips that go distances that we're not able to travel or we don't travel. For example, um, trips that are overnight or trips that are out of state, um, we, we don't travel those. So that this contract merely provides schools and offices with another mechanism to provide experiences for students. Baltimore County still will provide field trips. Um, again, the contract is, is another mechanism for schools to do that, schools and offices. Okay, thank you. Mr. Kuhn, did you have a question? I do. Thank you. Um, I'm, I'm assuming, but I hate to do that, that um, you've done a comparative analysis to say this is the only way we can do this and it's the cheapest way to do it. Is that, is that accurate? So instead of, for essence, uh, in essence, us hiring a few more drivers to be in basically, um, a pool to handle these types of trips, it's more economically feasible for us to contract out this work. I just want to make sure that that analysis has occurred and, and that we're definitely sure this is the best way to go. Sure. So I think the approach that we take is our primary objective is to provide transportation to students to and from school. And that is what the Office of Transportation's mission is. Secondarily, we have other objectives which include field trips. So we do provide tr field trips. Um, it's primarily between the windows when we're not pro transporting students to and from school, we do provide field trips. There are times when we are able to do, to do that outside of those hours, but primarily our objective is day-to-day -day transportation to and from school. That is the purpose of that contract. When we are not able to do that or it is outside of our, our transport window, um, that is the purpose of this contract. And the way that we are uh, cost effective is by the competitive bid. So everyone who is um, responsive and responsible is awarded and the schools can look at the various vendors and choose what, which one is most cost effective for them. Mr. McMillian. Mr. West, just approximately how many bus drivers do we have? Full-time bus drivers, 800 and so? Or? We have approximately um, 670. And 670 drivers. Yes. And is that considered full-time drivers, or does that include part-time drivers, too? That includes part-time drivers, but we have few. OK. And it does not uh, include the substitutes, but for it. Yeah, and I'm purposes. curious, what size substitute pool do you have available to you when somebody calls out sick? That would be, um, it, that varies per day. So the luxury of being a substitute is you can choose when to work and when not to work. Um, so it varies per day and per area. Um, generally speaking, um, I would say no more than 5 or 10% of a call-out window. So we're talking a couple of dozen substitutes across the county. So for 600 and some drivers, we have a couple dozen substitutes to right. take, take a route when somebody's out sick. Correct. And I would, I would get more accurate information to I didn't have that with me. That's but, OK. But yes. Thank you. Are there any other questions or comments? I just had a question to follow up. Um, Yes, ma'am. With our bargaining units, is this 
um, an issue that is previously discussed with them or is not in the purview to be discussed with them? To my knowledge, as a contract, this is not something that we have discussed with bargaining units. Um, this contract in no way, shape, or fashion compromises any positions, um, any FTE positions, uh, any substitute positions in no way, shape, or fashion. This contract is a support. It is a support to our mission. Again, I want to um, reiterate our objective is to provide transportation to students to and from school. Um, this contract allows an additional avenue for, for schools to provide services. It does not compromise any full-time or part-time employee. Okay, thank you. Is there a motion to accept this contract? Motion. It doesn't need a second because it came out of committee. All those in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? The motion carries. Thank you, Mr. Saris. Thank you, Mr. West. Thank you. I just wanted to add about 1.75 million was spent in fiscal 18, which was basis for that projected future expenditures. So our rising student population requires additional services. Thank you for that information. Our next item of business is item I, new business report on policies, first reading. Um, members of the board, the policy review committee asks that the board accept this report of the committee's approved proposed amendments to the following board policies. Policy 2361, distribution of non-school materials. Policy 8132, policy availability. Policy 8250, board member responsibilities and policy 8330 minutes. These recommendations are presented to you on tonight's agenda as exhibit I. Staff is available should board members have any questions about these policies. And I just want to remind our um, community that first reading is there presented. These uh, proposed amendments and policies are on board docs attached to this agenda item for uh, anyone to go back and review and also at they will be available for second reader where com public can come and comment on them. Anyone who wants to comment on these policies can come forward and do that. And then at third reader, the next meeting, um, policy review committee would bring them forward for the board's consideration and a vote. Do I have a motion to adopt the recommendation of the board's policy review committee? Thank you. No second is needed. Thank you since the recommendation comes from the committee. All in favor, please raise your hand. Any opposed? <laughs> raise your hand. Any opposed? Any abstain? Abs Thank you. The motion carries, so they are moved forward just to second reader. Our next item is J, work session report, student member of the board process. And for that, I call forward Ms. Murray. As they're coming forward, I just wanted to um, say thank you to Ms. Murray and uh, to BCSC for hosting today's event with Bedford um, and looking forward to this report by Ms. Murray, uh, Mr. Ruben Amaya, and Ms. Halima Adekoya. Good evening, everyone. Good evening, Chairwoman Causey, Vice Chair Hen, Superintendent White, and members of the board. I am Halima Adekoya, student member of the board. And I'm Ruben Amaya, BCSC President. And tonight we have with us our BCPS Staff Program Specialist, Ms. Nora Murray. We thank you for the opportunity to share our process on how we as students select the student member of the board, also known as SMOB. So, the role of the student member of the board. The role of the student member of the board is to represent the diverse population of BCPS and provide an informed student viewpoint to the Board of Education. 
Um, when we look at the timeline, it's from January to April based on the school calendar. Uh, we have the application process, then we have the selection committee, which does the screening of applications by the selected committee. Uh, then we have the nominating committee, which involves the interview process. Then we have our student-led forum, which includes speeches from the candidates, question and answer for the candidates, including campaigning and voting. So in our application packet, we have that the principals may recommend two students per high school. They must be a current sophomore or junior. They must complete and submit a completed application. They must submit one page essay on why I want to serve as student member. They must submit five letters of recommendation, one from principal, school counselor, English teacher, club slash school organization, and community organization. Last but not least, they must submit a copy of their transcript or report card and report card. Our selection committee is modeled off the process used by the Maryland Association of Student Councils, which includes the current SMOB, the BCSE officer team, um, the BCSE advisor, one middle school and one high school advisor. Previously, only two students participated in this process with eight adults. Committee members are sent all the applications to review. Committee meets in person and meets to discuss and determine who moves on to the nominating committee. Up next, we have our nominating committee, which is basically our interview portion. Who is involved? We have three students and four adults, the BCSC president, second vice president, who represents the middle school voice, the current student member, BCSC advisor, BCSC principal of the year, BCSC advisor of the year, and the communications officer. We have the interview process. We have the interview evaluation. Committee members um, know first the students are given their questions 15 minutes prior to your interview. Each interview lasts about 15 minutes. Committee members debrief each, question, each interview and come to a final conclusion after deliberation. This process was selected as it mirrors standard interview protocols and the process used for selecting the adult appointed member nomination. The top two candidates, no more than three, then move on to the student forum. Um, and when we look at the student-led forum, who's involved is the BCSE Executive Board, the Superintendent Student Advisory Council, high school student council presidents, a non-traditional student selected by the high school, three middle school students per school, on average about 200 students in attendance, students listen to speeches and participate in question and answer session with the candidates, candidates can campaign during lunch, and then voting occurs using a ballot after lunch. Candidates are notified after, after the event by the current student member of the board and the BCSE advisor. Top vote recipient's name, application materials, and a letter are submitted to the governor by the superintendent's office. Governor, so far, um, a governor has never denied a recommendation for this position that we are aware of. So moving forward, we are finally reaching our year five goal. Our goal is to record each student's speeches to be shown in every school, host regional town halls where candidates can participate locally in question and answer sessions. Most of all, provide an opportunity for every secondary student to vote online. Um, and just some things to consider. In total, there are 19 people involved in this process. Other jurisdictions receive larger scholarships, for example. Anne Arundel County, who have full voting rights, their SMOB receives $8,000 uh, for a scholarship. Carroll County, only an opinion vote, receives $3,500. Howard County has same voting rights as BCPS. They receive $5,000. Montgomery County, full voting rights, except negative personnel, receives $5,000. And the Prince George's County SMOB, with voting rights just like ours, receives an $18,000 scholarship. So that concludes our report, and we are happy to answer any questions. We have a oh, video to show you real, oh, real quick, quick yeah. a beautiful right. video. The handout you have in front of you is put together by the Maryland Association of Student Councils. It does show each jurisdiction's process for selecting a student member, whether they're voting or non-voting, um, who is confirmed by the governor versus who is appointed by student councils. And we do have a short video. Thank you, Jeremy. Midland High School representatives from around the county were afforded the opportunity to select from two outstanding finalists to become the student member of the board for the county system. These elections are incredibly important because the student member of the board is representing 113,000 students from July 1st to June 30th. So students should get to know the student member of the board and know their platform and know what they're fighting for as they sit around the dais. And the student member of the board are, is voting on policies and contracts that affect the students in the classroom. 
With such a diverse population, it is imperative that every student has the means to vocalize within a safe space our opinions on situations within the school community, nationally and globally. Diversity, that's the key. Diversity makes us stronger, but also generates challenges. Diversity calls for equity, equity fosters equality, equality creates change. Imagine a student for whom the teacher's perception of him or her may be far removed from the reality. In this special forum, Halima Adekoya and Yara Derice were able to share why they would be the best candidate to represent BCPS students as the student board member. These young ladies represented Milford Mill Academy and Patapsco High School and Center for the Arts well. Both candidates were passionate and pledged to make a difference if they were selected. I believe that education is very vital in a child's atmosphere, in a child's foundation. Now, when the education is not a sufficient or proper education is not given to a child, it shakes them up. For me, it's important that it was important that I got to the opportunity to be another active citizen in my community. I got the opportunity to share my thoughts and ideas and not just about what I believe, but about my peers and represent them and what they believe in. Because if we're the youth of tomorrow, we need the adequate education. We need to be in an adequate ed educational atmosphere that's based on what we want and how we believe we can learn and how we believe we can learn to our best potential. So I applied for being student member of the board because I wasn't someone that was very, I didn't have a voice as a kid. I wasn't someone who was represented. And I feel like if I were elected to be the next student member of the board, I would just be ecstatic that I have teachers now who believe in me. I have my parents who believe in me. But to have all these representatives from the dif uh, different schools who believe that I could represent them fairly and equally, that would just be mind blowing because I came into the application process not thinking that I would go to the interviews. And now I'm at the student forums and I'm one of the finalists. Both candidates participated in a lengthy question and answer session. This gave the students an opportunity to become familiar with the candidates to assist with making an informed decision. There are two great candidates. Um, coming to this small forum has sparked and enlightened leadership in me, which is what I like the most and uh, look forward to seeing what's next. The students selected Halima Adekoya as the next student member for the upcoming school year. Now Halima will be recommended to Governor Larry Hogan, who appoints the student member of the board. Any questions? And the winner was and Ms. Adekoya. And the winner Adekoya. was Ms. Adekoya. <laughs> Thank you for that really enlightening presentation and thank you both for the service that you do for all students in Baltimore County Public Schools. <laughs> Board members, do you have questions or comments for our panel? Hearing none, we thank you very much and good luck to the candidates that are thank coming you. up. Thank you, one is in attendance this evening. Oh, well, welcome. Matt Rubenstein. Thank you. Our next item is item J, work session. Nope, excuse me, we're moving right along here. Item K, work session, report high school capacity study. For that, I ask uh, Dr. Brown and Mr. Smith to come forward. Uh, this is a work session for receiving information, asking questions, and discussing. As board practice and custom, no motions are considered. It's prudent for us to understand the funding that will be finalized in just a few weeks before making any further decisions. Many unknowns related to funding are occurring right now in the legislative session in Annapolis, which ends uh, the first week of April. And then we're going to have the budget development for Baltimore County by the county executive presented in the second week of April. Uh, there are encouraging things happening in Annapolis uh, regarding funding, and we appreciate all of the legislators and also other public officials that are going to Annapolis to advocate for funding for uh, construction, because uh, Baltimore County certainly has um, aggressive plans that we would like to pursue for our students. So with that, Mr. Smith, Ms. Dr. Brown, Good evening, Superintendent White, members of the board and community. I'm pleased to be joined this evening by uh, Mr. Kevin Smith. Uh, we're gonna present to you, um, again, an overview of the high school capacity study that uh, was presented by Sage Policy Group, and also uh, a connection then to our current uh, capital plan. 
So uh, the good news for us is um, you know, Baltimore County schools continue to grow. Uh, families continue to choose Baltimore County Public Schools for the educational needs of their children. While we started this year with a nearly 14, 114,000 students, at this point we've got nearly 115,000 students. So during the course of the year, we've added nearly 1,000 students. In the next 10 years, we project to grow by yet another 5,000 students. This growth isn't, however, equal at all levels of the organization. That is to say, the growth isn't equal at the elementary, middle, and high school levels. This slide um, begins to show that. Uh, the bars that are in red uh, reflect elementary enrollment and projected enrollment uh, starting in September 30th of this year and then progressing. The green bars reflect middle school enrollment and the blue bars reflect high school enrollment. This, this uh, slide is taken from Students Count, which is a publicly available document and one that's been provided to the board. <laughs> one that uh, members of our community often like to reference. Um, as you'll see, if you look at uh, this chart closely, you'll see that the elementary bars are roughly the same height all the way across. We're adding 600 students across this window of time, uh, so the elementary enrollment is relatively <laughs> stable. Middle school enrollment, on the other hand, we're adding 2,100 seats. Um, and uh, you can see that when you look at the green bars, they go up a little bit. On the other hand, there's a clear upward trend in the, in the blue bars, and that's because we're adding 4,100 students at the high school level across the next 10 years. So as our high school population um, continues to grow, uh, we're going to have some challenges. Uh, our current capital plan, uh, improvement plan, or the CIP, contains additional seats for our elementary schools. Uh, it has another 3,600 uh, seats and it'll bring us up to over 56,000 seats. The middle school um, plans within that, the two schools, Perry Hall Middle School and uh, Pine Grove Middle School, add another 1,600 seats and, and bring the total of middle school seats to 2,850. These additional seats at the elementary and middle school levels bring the available seats at elementary and middle levels in alignment with anticipated growth. At our high school level, on the other hand, uh, we will simply not have enough seats for our high school students. By 2022, and, and I want to convey a certain sense of urgency with this, by 2022, we'll have more high school students than collectively we have seats across the entire system. Um, we simply will not have enough seats. There's no way to boundary our way out of it. We need capital improvements to be able to make, um, to be able to provide seats for all our students. At our peak enrollment, we'll need at least 1,600 additional seats. Now, now, 1,600 seats might sound like one high school to, to, to a casual observer. Unfortunately, our, our seat needs are distributed across the county. Uh, this, this map shows uh, the peak enrollment for all, all our high schools across the county. Um, if you look at, uh, at this map, you can interpret it, those schools that are in red, the darker the red, the more overcrowded the school is. Uh, so you can see that Towson and Sparrows Point are very red, <laughs> uh, as is Catonsville and the, and the Southwest. Uh, but I'd like to also point out the orange. Uh, so, you know, Perry Hall, Parkville, uh, and Pikesville are all going to be overcrowded as well. Uh, so it's important to understand that, again, this need for seats, no single project is going to resolve this. There, there's no way to get this done with one. The seat needs are distributed across the system, and they're going to require multiple projects to get that done. Now, in addition to needing multiple projects, we have to be very thoughtful about the order of the projects. There are only 24 high schools in the system. Decisions about one school, in terms of sequencing, impact other schools. The order of assembly matters, and the order of assembly really matters when we start talking about capital uh, planning and getting reimbursed from the state for our funding. The, the, the projects have to be sequenced in an order that we can be able to uh, get the county reimbursed. I'm going to come back to that later because it's such a critical point. Uh, I'm going to emphasize it again later as we go on. So that being said, it's probably not a surprise as to why we engaged into a high school study. And so we can talk about sort of how that happened. Um, you know, following board approval in January of 2018, uh, we engaged with Sage Policy Group, and, who partnered with GWWO Architects, uh, to perform the study. 
initially the study was um, meant to have two parts to it. There were supposed to be a series of focus groups, and those focus groups were to be followed by a series of public information sessions coupled with a survey. Uh, based on community feedback, uh, a second phase to that work was added. So, what did we learn from that, that first phase? What did it look like? So, um, one of the things you'll, you'll see here, this sort of outlines uh, the nine community uh, feedback sessions that were, were conducted, the locations. We had two each at, um, in terms of the focus groups at each of the four high schools listed, and then a principal's focus group for high school principals. This was followed by a series of three public information sessions. What do we hear from the community in that process? It was very clear that uh, members of the community preferred smaller schools. Less than 2% of the population thought a school of 1,800 or greater was appropriate. It was very clear that the folks did not want large schools as part of the solution. Uh, it was also clear that, that um, the participants were interested in improving um, educational opportunities for students. They were really interested in magnet programs and how those magnet programs could be made available to a broader range of students across the county. Uh, so there were questions about access and how to make equitable access to magnet program across the county. <coughs> we heard loud and clear from some communities that um, the, their, the integrity of their feeder patterns, their neighborhoods was really important to them. This was particularly true in the Southwest. And for those of you who recall, I know, you know it was three months ago, but if you, you think back to what Mr. Basu was talking about, he talked about the Southwest in particular and how, how important feeder patterns in, in the continuity of neighborhoods in the Southwest West was for that community. We also um, heard very loudly and very clearly that facility conditions mattered. Uh, that uh, folks thought that the, the study was incomplete if we didn't at least consider facility conditions as part of that work. And then maybe what was a little surprising but, but good to know was that the, the participants understood that this had a price tag, that, that this was going to mean that taxes were going to have to go up. And, and largely they were, were accepting of the idea that it, this was going to require, they'd rather spend more to get the right thing than to cut a corner and, and to sort of push the can further down the road. So again, in response to the community feedback, the superintendent directed staff uh, to develop another set of scenarios, uh, or actually to work with uh, Mr. Basu to, to have him develop another series of scenarios, specifically considering facility conditions, continuity of neighborhoods, and the opportunity to expand magnet programming. And again, this is all things that we've talked about previously, but uh, the superintendent put out a letter to that effect, and then three scenarios were, were developed that. In addition, we wanted to provide the community a, an opportunity to provide additional input. So three additional information sessions were set aside for the community, and an additional survey was set aside for them. And you can see the three dates and the locations for them uh, for those information sessions. So this process spanned um, over four months of community engagement and, and multiple ways, uh, multiple venues for folks to be able to give us information. We had over 10,000 respondents to the survey. We had hours and hours, again, of public input uh, and feedback into the process. So at the conclusion of what was almost a year's work, um, again, that um, last public information session and the survey closed on October 7th, by mid-October, the first day you guys were here, uh, you had a report. And, and that report was presented to the board and the community along with all these materials which are out on the web uh, to inform the process. So what did we learn? What came out of that? Um, the, the first scenarios that had uh, been provided to the community initially were organized around themes. Uh, none of them were really realistic. Uh, uh, Mr. Basu was very clear that uh, they were intended to, to get the community's feedback about well, what happens if you maximize the use of all the available seats, which means you have to move a lot of kids? How do people feel about that? What happens if you just build a ton of extra seats? How do folks feel about that? What happens if you focus on magnet programs? So they were all organized around themes. Well, when we had the final three scenarios come for forward, they sort of hybridized those. And what do we see from that? Uh, the three uh, scenarios that came forward were 
viable scenarios to move forward with. And the price tags for them were relatively comparable. They ran from 590 million to 620 million, so there wasn't a lot of variability there. There were, as Mr. Basu pointed out, some very clear regional preferences for that. Uh, four out of five of the, the communities preferred uh, scenarios A or B, and the central area, on the other hand, really preferred scenario C. One of the other things that we heard from Mr. Basu, which I sort of echoed on the front end of this, was the order of projects really matters. So to be very clear, um, this is not a problem of your making. This is a problem that we've all inherited over time. If you, the order of the scenarios or the order of the projects isn't done correctly, you will create problems that are of your making. And you need to be aware of that that they, if these are not sequenced right, there will be challenges that emerge from this. And those will be yours based on your decisions. So again, this challenge, and I think uh, Mr. Su, uh, Basu was very clear about this, um, didn't arise overnight and won't be, won't be resolved overnight. This is gonna take decades to move through this process. So where do we start? Mr. Basu was very clear um, that the, the most logical starting point and, and the most equitable um, starting point for this work was Lansdowne. Why? Well, as I mentioned, you've got overcrowding in the Southwest. You also have the facility with the lowest facility rating. So if you take those two factors, low facility rating, overcrowding, it makes sense that this would be a good starting point for the community. Um, second, again, very clear and compelling argument. Towson, why? Again, Towson High School is the most overcrowded school. It is projected within the next couple years to be over 150% of its state rated capacity. It also has the lowest facility rating of any of the central area schools. Towson has the lowest, Lock Raven has the next lowest, and then Delaney. So again, the most overcrowded school is Towson. And, and again, very clear that it, and we're running out of options to provide relief for that school. So there's an urgency to, to be able to do something about that. At that point, I, I, I'd like to say prioritization beyond that was easy, but no. I, I think prioritization beyond that gets really difficult. And, and you heard it tonight. There are competing interests here, and we have to be honest about that. There are competing interests, and the choices that are made will have impacts on different communities. And it's not a matter of whether or not somebody needs a project. And I think Anabon was very clear about that. Delaney needs a project. No one's <laughs> saying that Delaney doesn't. The question's when. Who comes first? Who comes second? Who comes third? And how do you do it in an equitable way? How do you do it in a way that makes sense so that you don't inadvertently cause problems for other schools in the process? So, two cases in point. And I really wish our Southeast Area Advisory person had hung around a little bit. <laughs> uh, because I think, um, and I think her name's Ms. Gordalis, and I'm probably messing that up. Ms. Gordalis, um, uh, she's right. Right now, and I'm going to start at the bottom of this uh, because we had someone here tonight, the south, southeast area right now has more students. If I look at Dundalk, Patapsco, and Sparrows Point, there are more students in that area than there are seats. Right now. And because of the nature of the geography in that area, there's no way to boundary out of it. That's a peninsula. Uh, unless we boat those kids across. <laughs> yeah, there, there's really no good way to solve that. And, and I, I am not, again, trying to say that, that schools here don't need to be replaced. But I want, want to be clear. If you choose to put Delaney before Sparrows Point, this, this region's already underwater. It will be the most overcrowded region in the county. We will have roughly 25% of the students being served in relocatable units outside their schools. 25%. Think about what that means for lunch. Think about what that means for safety. It's a lot. It's a lot of kids. And, and 
poor Pete, he's probably cringing right now. I don't know if I can fit, you know, 28 relocatable units across those three sites. I'm not sure they'll fit. 28 relocatables in total. Perry Hall, there's a reason in all three scenarios, Lock Raven is brought up. Lock Raven is considered a solution in all three scenarios for a reason. Mm -hmm. One, it's got the second lowest facility rating in the central area. Again, facilities and seats. And two, Perry Hall and Parkville. There's no other viable option for Perry Hall or Parkville. Perry Hall will have, and my, my staff was out at Perry Hall last night in the Northeast Advisory Area Committee. Um, Perry, the Perry Hall community has been, done a lovely job advocating for new seats. They needed them at the elementary level. They did a lovely job advocating for middle school seats and they're very concerned about their middle school project. A few have pointed down the road and said, well, you know, if you've got a lot of kids in elementary school and they get, come to middle school, come into high school. <laughs> 22% of the students will be served outside of the building at Perry Hall. And that's if all those relocatables could be put there. It's a challenge. So again, how these projects are sequenced will disenfranchise entire, entire communities if you're not careful. You have to be thoughtful. I don't envy your task. I really don't. You have to be thoughtful about how you approach this. And again, we're only talking about high school needs. The high school study focused on high schools. We didn't look at middle school facilities. We didn't look at middle school facility needs. And oh, by the way, Mr. McMillian, when I was talking about Sparrows Point in the southeast area, all that's just based on the high school. We know that there is a co-facility with the middle school. That makes it worse. There'll be more relocatables there because of the middle school too. It actually exacerbates the problem. It makes it worse. I was just focusing on high schools. So again, we didn't look at middles. I know there are middle school facility needs. We have heard there is focused overcrowding in the Northeast area. Pleasant Plains is right. We're gonna need some projects in the, the, that Northeast area. So again, we've just been talking about high school needs. Um, I think a sensible thing, there, there are two projects here that make a lot of sense. Lansdowne and, and Towson, clearly high needs, no debate. The board has already agreed to do a 10 year capital plan. I think it makes a ton of sense to slow down a little bit because these projects are not gonna happen overnight anyways. Even if you started with Towson and Lansdowne, slow down a little bit and figure out how we equitably put projects in an order so that they come first, come second in a way that ensures that we get the, the maximum amount of reimbursement from, from the state for it and that we're thoughtful about how we're supporting our students and that we don't inadvertently create challenges that, that are not gonna be able to be addressed. And with that, I'm gonna pass it over to Mr. Smith to talk about the capital plan. Thank you, Dr. Brown. Um, if those of you who don't know, Dr. Brown and I and our team spend a tremendous amount of time together. They plan, we design, and construct. If the two are out of sync, you have huge problems. We cannot stress enough, I don't wanna sound like a broken record, but this is what this is. Order of assembly is critical here. We have to get the order of assembly of what projects we do correct, because if we don't, we run the risk of exacerbating a problem that we currently see now. On the facility sides, I don't think we see anything different than what Dr. Brown said. Lansdowne and Towson clearly felt like the two projects that should be moving forward if there was a decision needed to be made in the short term. However, I'd like to stress, and I think I've heard members of this board, the 10-year capital plan lays out the blueprint for all schools so that you have transparency and that you have a roadmap that our community that can trust that this is how we're moving forward with a 10-year option. If we build one high school or if we build five high schools, each high school from planning to design to construction averages around five years to complete. 
So to Dr. Brown's earlier statement, unfortunately, these are not going to just pop up out of the ground in a year. It's going to, this is a 15, 20, 25 year building plan for high schools. And that's why it's critical that we get it right. And the order of assembly, assembly is critical. Um, the county executive came and spoke to this group and has been going around the county talking about the physical um, challenges that we face and the requests to our state legislators um, about additional funding. Some of you from this board have actually gone down to testify. Ms. White and I and other members of the board have gone down to testify to show that Baltimore County needs more school construction dollars. There are more coming into the state. We want to increase our share. But I'd like for us to be mindful of the fact that how we do that is going to set the next generations up for success. And I think that this board will be um, wise to make sure that we all have a collective. And the 10-year ca capital plan is a plan that is done with this board, with the superintendent and the administration, with the CE and the county council. It is a unified plan that all four entities have to have some collaboration on in order for it to work. It appears from all we've heard that that is now the stars are aligned. The stars are aligned that the 10 year capital plan that is in the proposed budget hopefully will move forward with funding because if it does, then we get to set the, we get to set the vision of what our construction plans are going to be for the next 10 years. And our communities will have something to say. My project is number 16. And the only reason it moves, if it's an emergency, if Dr. Brown and I see that we have a spike in a region that really needs to be addressed, we'll have to bring an emergency project forward. And that, that consideration will be built into that 10-year plan. The, um, the concern that Dr. Brown has for the Southeast, that's a different beast. And why that's a different beast is you can't solve some of the Southeast I issues with adjacent schools because they're out well, no pun intended, they're on a peninsula. You can't, there's, there's only a few ways you can get to them. And moving students up to other schools turns into a logistical nightmare as it relates to transportation and time on buses. And I know that this board has been, has been very keen about we want to shorten ride times and make the experience from start to finish more palatable. And so we want to make sure that we get the order of assembly. I've provided additional documents for the capital plan and just information for you can, to read to, to further this discussion. Um, I'm not going to belabor the point because Dr. Brown and I, the, the, these two are in unison as to how we're bringing the approach. So at that point in time, I'd like to open the floor up for any questions. Thank you for that presentation and we will get to um, questions. And I do just want to say um, thank you for the work. I know that you and your team over the set past several years have been working very aggressively in terms of the Schools for Our Future uh, school construction project and alleviating um, the uh, excessive heat in classrooms that we've had, having tremendous success with getting the number of schools that are air conditioned up to 96 percent. And also, um, while we do have some schools that are without it, I was very pleased and thank you, Ms. White, for facilitating a conversation that we had regarding uh, the staff and the team looking for solutions and having um, work underway. And we're looking forward to an update because we understand that with the construction of some schools may being pushed further out than we would like, uh, that we need to look more closely at temporary cooling solutions. So I appreciate your work there. I appreciate yes, you facilitating that meeting um, today. And we look forward to proposals in the future um, that the staff will be bringing to us. Um, also, I do want to say that we appreciate the legislature and the uh, governor and also the county council and the county executive, all of whom are working um, assertively on behalf of public school construction funding. Um, our county executive has stated that school construction funding is his number one priority for the legislative session. Um, this that's going on right now and is going to end in the first week of April. So we're grateful for the commitment to public school funding um, and we're hopeful that we're going to um, get very good news out of Annapolis and then um, get news out of the Baltimore County when their um, budget planning gets announced in the second week of April. So we appreciate that. Uh, we did have a meeting 
the uh, board, several members went down with the Baltimore Senate delegation, and they also sent us a letter um, about their support for construction funding, so we appreciate all the work that's happening on behalf of the school system. Uh, with that, I'll open it up to questions and comments. And we'll start over here, and we'll just move around, okay? So I just want to say I'm very happy that the stars are aligning for a 10-year plan. I've been railing all over social media about the need for one for three years, and I'm, I'm very, very encouraged that it seems like this is actually going to happen. So if I'm listening to your presentation of this report correctly, it sounds like what you would like to do, if you had a preference, would be to take all of this high school data and use this data in the development of a comprehensive 10-year capital plan that is encompassing the other schools as well. So am, am I hearing you correctly that you don't want the board to take action on the high school capacity study until we start working on this 10-year capital plan? We'll say it a different way. The, t the high school capacity study coupled with the um, facilities assessment study that we did, that, that parts of that had been updated for the high school piece, those will be elements of a 10-year capital plan because it will shorten the horizon for completion. Because if a third party comes in and has to do all that work over again, it took us over a year to work with SAGE and GWWO just on the high school piece. So we're seeing those pieces will be elements of um, what will eventually become the 10-year capital plan, which will shorten the horizon. All we're saying is um, if there's any consideration about which projects need to happen. Order of assembly is critical, and from the SAGE study related to high schools, it, 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 it appeared to be clear choices as it relates to what are the first two projects you need to start with. We're, we're not necessarily giving you recommendations. We're saying, from us, order of assembly is critical. And we, we have to keep saying that enough because if we don't get the order right, things get complicated at the beginning, middle, and end, and so we're saying these are the components that we need to have in case these, this board wants to have any consideration as we move forward. The 2000, the FY20 capital plan is, is literally cemented. We're, we're getting funding. We're saying for planning for FY21, we want you to have information so you have time to deliberate appropriately and you have enough time to make an informed decision about what needs to happen for our next phase of capital planning. So if we have the state request that we start in August, or right before that. Correct. If we add high schools to that state request under the projects that are already there, um, what is your estimated completion date for those high schools? And I guess my question is, the way I look at the capital request, it looks like to me that even if it gets um, if we start adding high schools to that priority list, even next fiscal year, we will still be finishing the seven, eight, ten, whatever elementary schools that are above it in the priority list. So where, at what point does the board within our fiscal budgeting process have to make a decision on this? And at what point is not making a decision delaying things? So does that make sense? Like, does, I, I want does. a sense of when do we have to do this and when can we do it in regard to the budget process? So let me, let me um, start with this. Again, we wanted to bring the um, SAGE report, really the summary, back to this board's attention right now because we know, just as you said, come August, then there's another state uh, plan submission. Certainly the county executive has laid out and he said that um, major projects will be delayed based on the current fiscal realities. However, as a board, we thought that you might want to take a look at what's before you. Certainly it is your decision whether or not 
you choose to act now and to move forward just in case that, you know, again, we don't know what's going to happen with state funding. We're not quite sure um, if that timeline will change. But so we wanted you to have this information, and certainly you can make the determination on when to act. But but we wanted to do it in enough time where you would have full consideration of what the SAGE report said, given the current capital um, and fiscal realities, and then as you're moving forward, you would have sufficient time to make those decisions about how you would like to address your timeline. So that's really in the, bur in the board's um, purview. So August is the soonest point we can add this to a budget? Well, the state's uh, capital submission is is in August, correct? Correct. We start the process in That's August. That's when we start the process. So again, I know that it's it seems early, it's March, but it really isn't when we're looking at all that has to go into it and all that you'll need to consider. So we wanted to bring the report back as a summary for the board's consideration. Mr. McMillian or Ms. Joseph? Gentlemen, how do we start strategically implementing the 10-year plan now? Does it start with a motion from me? Or how do we get this ball rolling now? The 10-year the, the capital plan is already, all we're, waiting for, all we're waiting for is the, the proposed budget to be approved. Once that's approved and that item is still intact, we're, we're ready to start then. We already have a draft um, um, scope, which will require more feedback from you guys. But we're not waiting till, until when that gets approved, we're saying we're going to be ready to go as soon as it approves so that we can start start our solicitation process. In essence, you did approve when you approved the budget. There was about $750,000 yes, uh, allotted that was in the proposed budget that has now gone over to the county. So you have already said that this is something that we want to move forward with. I'm talking about the list of schools on that comprehensive plan. Now, that, I, I don't remember seeing a list. Is there a um, list that I've overlooked? The 10-year capital plan is, is a, I'm sorry, it's an external 10-year capital plan. So you, we're going to have an external um, group come in, work with our teams, both county and county schools and the county, uh, county government and this board and the community about what, similar to what um, SAGE did about how does, what does our plan look like for the next 10 years, elementary, middle, and high? So the projects have not been identified, and they will be identified through a, a, a community engagement process that will be done by an outside group utilizing the high school study that has already been done and the physical facilities assessment that has done to speed that process along. Okay, so, so that they haven't been identified as of yet, but we still have to put together an annual capital improvement program every year. This will just be our roadmap for future years after this year and whenever it's complete. Okay, and the approximate timeline for the schools on that list? T t give me a little bit more, sir. Uh, we're talking about a 10-year capital plan. We're talking about the money being approved through the county executive and county council. Yes, sir. And then we're talking about an outside group coming together and gathering information and coming up with, I'm visualizing a list Making of recommendations of how the projects need to be staged over the next 10 years. Now, from that list, that list is not going to say when, they, when they're completed. It's going to say, based on funding, projects 1, 2, 3, and 4, based on what state and local funding annually looks like, will be poised to move forward. Then the next year, it will indicate which, yeah. based on funding. So it, it won't necessarily derive when the projects will start in. Okay. Starting in, it will just identify what's the order of assembly. How do you how do you pick the? Okay. So are we looking a year and a half, two years, in order to come up with that list? Um, that process is designed to take place between um, whenever we start July. We're hoping that the what we've heard is it takes about 18 to 24 months. But we just had an extensive high school study. We just had a facilities assessment. So in our, our estimation, we can cut that time significantly because that's not something they're not coming in and building it from the start. All they're going to do is update it. For example, Pikesville High School, when we started it, was in need of a renovation. It's done. So now they've got to go out and reassess and say it may have been a 2.34. Now it's a 5. Next project. They just have to update to make sure projects that may have had some renovations or some work done to it, does that affect the score as we start to compile what that new data looks like? So, Mr. McMillian, let me chime in a little bit here to clarify, I think. Um, 
thank you for that explanation. So part of the benefit of doing a 10-year strategic plan by utilizing um, an outside group to come in and do it in conjunction with the school system and the county council and the county executive is that it's, it's done comprehensively and part of it includes community input and then part of it includes deliberation by the entities being the Board of Education and the school system and the county council and the county executive. So if we get approval for uh, the budget, the op for that in the operating budget that we get starting July 1, where that would be is focused conversations that are guided by the, by the consultant. So where I see this time frame coming in is as a board, we would use part of the summer with board retreats to understand from after getting community input to come up with prioritization. And what they do is then they use kind of an algorithm to say, based on the facilities, if the priorities agreed to by the Board of Education and the County Executive and the County Council with the school system's recommendation and information, is that the overcrowding is the number one or modernization of facilities, and they, they rank it all out, and then the projects are ranked. And then what we do when you're talking about timelines is we work through those projects as quickly as we can based on the funding we receive. So we're gonna get a lot more information in the next couple of weeks uh, from the legislature and Annapolis and also from the county government and that will also help guide the work with uh, the 10-year plan. Ms. Joes? Yes. So I'm looking at this and it's very clear that Towson is overcrowded. Is building Towson gonna take some of the pressure out of Lock, Raven, and Perry Hall? So no, uh, Towson would effectively relieve itself. Uh, the projected growth for Towson. So when we talked about sequencing and interdependence of projects, because Towson effectively relieves itself, it's a self-contained solution. And, okay. and, and it, it's less of a challenge in that regard. Um, one of the things, on the other hand, that, that Mr. Basu had pointed out was that Delaney, because of its location, isn't uh, an available space. Um, adding seats to Delaney doesn't help Perry Hall because that relief would have to come through Lock Raven through a very um, uh, sparsely dense uh, populated portion of the county. It, it, it's not a you have to domino across two schools to, to try to do that. Um, and in like fashion, uh, Lansdowne, in part because of the way uh, the community had talked about wanting to, to observe and, and maintain the feeder patterns, et cetera, it is a self-contained solution. It is also, again, the facility with the lowest rating and focused overcrowding. So again, if you go back to, to what was outlined by Basu in terms of critical areas in the county, Southwest, Towson, and then the Southeast. So I see the Southeast clearly Sparrow's point. It has almost a 25% increase. It's, it's the largest growth in terms of high school. So that is something that I as a planner would be focusing on right now. And it's a small school. <laughs> it's a small school is also a middle and a high school, mm -hmm. which is yes. not something that's Correct. favorable. So that's where I would be focusing. And I'm looking at the Southwest, which is Lansdowne and Catonsville. Mm -hmm. That's where, and I guess Lansdowne has the facilities rating, and that must be a question for uh, Mr. Dixit there. Um, so how do we take that into account, and how do we prioritize it? I mean, I could do it, but, you know, we have to do it in a comprehensive and cohesive way. And if we had the money, we would obviously build all the schools, but we don't. So we have a limited amount of dollars, and how do we uh, spread this out fiscally, responsible, equitable, at the same time you get the most bang for your buck. And that's where we're gonna be looking at on to you. I'm gonna start with the money piece and then I'll do the plan. The, the time horizon that we're talking about here, y you have time to plan into all of your needs. So so we're, we're, we're saying if you take your time and be methodical, you have time to address all of your needs. Everybody gets addressed. What we're saying is get the order right. We're saying get the right projects at the right time. We're not telling anybody you can't have. We're saying if we put the wrong ones first, then you run the risk of somebody not, not being able to have. We're, that's what we're saying. So um, we don't want to 
give the impression that um, some of the things that the high school study recommended that we we are opposed to it. We're just saying what Basu and the Sage Group mentioned about let's make sure we get the right projects at the beginning because they'll they'll give immediate relief to those two school regions immediately and then you can start looking at how do you regionally start knocking off these projects after that which which to the earlier statement that's where the 10-year capital plan will be critical because at that point in time everyone would know where they are in the in the order as funding becomes available both state and local so also where's your population projections coming from and i know you mentioned that earlier are you working in conjunction with Baltimore County planning? Are you working, taking some U.S. Census data as well? Are you incorporating all of that TAS data, which is traffic and zoning, uh, to see what's projected, where houses are being built? Is that all incorporated? So we use an industry standard in terms of methodology. We use a yes. cohort survival method uh, yep. for, for projecting the enrollment, which is essentially, you know, what proportion of your second graders proceed to third grade? Uh, that is a backward look in time. Um, and that has some challenges to it, but we do work with the Department of, uh, of Planning. And again, cohort survival is the industry standards how school systems project enrollment. But we thought it was really important, to your point, to look forward. So we started partnering with the Department of Planning and we got really interested in, okay, permitted housing, well, if we have permitted housing, we know it's getting built. Mm -hmm. We know based on the region of the county and the type of housing, we know how many students are yielded so we, now we can look forward. We can say how many students are coming from this housing that, that, and when do we anticipate them coming? And that gets woven into our projections. Because I think that happened in Harford County where they were building out and then the schools didn't have the capacity. So they had to pull back all the planned projects to 55 plus. Mm -hmm. So that way there would be no kids coming in. So that's why I was asking about the planning portion, where are houses being built? Mm -hmm. um, and Sparrow's point in particular because of the uh, Under Armour or the the trade point Atlantic, trade that's going to yeah, be a major line. hub. Yes. So there will be houses, and like you mentioned, so people will stay there if there's jobs and good schools. Mm -hmm. So that is an area that I would be concerned with. Southwest definitely Lansdowne, Catonsville, and Towson. I mean, nobody's going to. Um, mm -hmm. Those are the three areas that I'm looking at, and this is just um, something based on data. That's so. consistent with the SAGE study. So Correct, that, that yes. all aligns with what? And that's something that you can easily defend 10 years from now when we get pulled on to why did you guys pick those schools. It's, it's easily defendable because it's based on research data and equity. And, it, and again, uh, if we go back to the SAGE study and what Mr. Bursu presented, the first two projects that he outlined, lands down in Towson. Okay, thank you. Okay. Ms. Mack? I just wanted to clarify, um, I thought you said Lansdowne is stands by itself, but Lansdowne, did I misunderstand? I was referring to the southwest area. Right. The southwest area is um, somewhat self-contained by Route 40, based on feeder patterns and the alignment of feeder patterns. Right, but a new Lansdowne appropriately sized does help Catonsville out. Absolutely. Yes. Okay, I just wanted to be clear on that. And I also wanted to say that I was at Lansdowne last week. and. I'm not a scientist, I am not, um, I'm just a person, but when you walk down a set of steps and there are no clear points on the steps, they're all worn away and some of the railings are missing and the office has a big <coughs> divot in it, um, Lansdowne definitely needs a new school. <coughs> but I would not ever want to pit one neighborhood against another and that's why I am in full support of what Ms. Rowe outlined, taking a look at what money we have, what timeline we have, and then we as a board, working with staff, the county executive, and the county council come up with what meets the needs of all communities. Mr. Kuhn. Thank you for your presentation. This is great information. Um, so we have needs, we know that. They're outlined here in reds and bright oranges and what have you. <clears throat> How do we get moving? Like we've talked about planning money before and the fact that we know we have these needs and we kind of light on them, but we don't know if the money's actually there for, for the 2020 time frame, right? We've talked about the $30 million that was earmarked, but we're not sure. Is it? I don't know if it's even going to be in the budget, I guess is my question. It, it's available. 
Um, okay. It's just you, you have to have the projects identified but I, before I think the county is going to start releasing it. So we just have to know what the plan is. So you, you're, you're emphasizing order of projects um, and maximizing state, uh, state funding. State participation, correct. So what, what does that actually mean? that we can only build so fast and we're only going to get $40 million from the state a year or $100 million or whatever they decide on and we have to match that carefully or, or we, we're going to go alone and spend more county funds and because we're not going to have state dollars. I'm trying to understand what that statement means so that we move appropriately. I promise you I'm going to try to make this as least complicated as possible because it is a complicated process. The state has a cash flow option. So they're only going to fund a certain amount each year because that's what they allocate to each school system. What we're saying is um, in order to get the maximum allocation from the projects, it has to meet a host of criteria, enrollment adjacencies, facility conditions, seat needs, and, and a host of other things that, I, that are part of our favorite phone book, that are part of that. It's all in there. So we have to make sure that um, if a school is, there you go, if a school is uh, eligible for 46% of state participation, anything that doesn't meet the eligibility, the percentage goes down. So that's why order of assembly is great here because we want to make sure we're doing the, process, the projects that are going to get the maximum state participation up front because then that means the minimum county, county dollars that's going to have to underwrite all of it. Okay, thank you. Yep. That was very helpful. And then, so we're building a bunch of elementary schools. Um, we made this high school study, and and we have some more seats. But you alluded to the fact that, we, I mean, do we have any blind spots with middle schools, or or do we know and we're confident that we have what we need, or we've planned what we need for middle schools? Because I I don't I don't have a good feel for that. So when we, um, we were responsive to the Perry Hall community, I mean, they were spot on that, the, you know, while you had all this elementary overcrowding, those students went to middle school, it's already the largest middle school in, in the county, um, they needed relief. Um, Ridgely Middle School is also in that uh, bucket. It needs relief as well, which is why Pine Grove and the new, um, site in Nottingham were, were identified as relief strategies for middle school. One helps with Perry Hall, the other helps with both Perry Hall and Ridgely. They're strategically placed to maximize relief and also maximize the amount of funding we get back because, as, as Mr. Smith was mentioning, funding is in part depend, dependent on the, the, the number of seats that are adjacent to a school. So if, again, um, there aren't an adequate number of seats needed based on adjacencies, then you can't justify a project. Or again, the available funding for that project goes downhill. So what? are those, I'm sorry, I, I don't want to cut you off, but I don't want to belabor the point either. I'm, I'm looking at the last slide with the list of identified projects and I see a Northeast Area Elementary at Ridge Road. Is that, is that one of the no, that's an elementary. I'm sorry, there's Northeast Area Middle also, right. number 16 and 17. So that's a 1,400 seat. Is that what you're talking about, like Nottingham or? Yeah, that's or the Nottingham side. Okay, all right. And then the Pine Grove for the other. I, there are other focus areas of the county that I would be a little concerned about in terms of overcrowding, particularly um, Catonsville Middle. And there's limited potential for solution around Catonsville Middle. Um, so that's, a concern. I don't know that we have a, a, a thorough inventory right now or update inventory of facility need. Well, what will happen with the 10-year capital plan right. is that we, we can look at every level mm -hmm. and build it in. Yeah. The, 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 the goal of the 10-year plan is to avoid pitting communities against each other. I, I think That's we'll been the, 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 the feeding frenzy for years, and whether it's right, wrong, or different, doesn't really matter. That's just how it's been. What this is going to do is it's going to say we, we, we sort of have a road map for high schools. We've got elementary, for the most part, addressed. We realize that in the Oakley, Pleasant Plains, Hartford here corridor, there's a problem. There may be other problems. We realize that 
as they matriculate from elementary to move to high to middle school, we've got to address that. Now with the 10-year capital plan, that's a factor. We're going to address that in the plan so that now we don't have this thing where everybody's trying to get the same dollar. We just have to say, here is how the project is going to stage every level. And, and, and Ms. Rowe pointed out earlier, she said you have all this high school data now. And we seem underway on the elementary side, and that's why I was asking about the middle school. Like, is is that a missing piece of this and this ten-year plan that we're we funded, or at least we plan on funding, is going to address that? So, let me lean in on that a little bit. Um, the one area, and for those who who have been around on the board for a while, the one uh, level of our system where we actually had a significant number of excess seats for years was middle, middle school, school. Yeah. Um, across the county. So um, we will have an excess number of available seats at the middle school level across the county. The question is whether or not we have pockets that can't be addressed um, easily by boundaries or, or other relief strategies. Okay, just so I'm clear, you're saying we are fine with middle schools. I'm saying that, that we will have more seats at the middle school level than we will have students. Um, but, but they're all spread out. When you look at the geography, we're surrounding the city. So, like you said, I can see red and, and orange myself. So, I, I don't know all the feeder patterns mm -hmm. by heart. Like, so, so, again, um, we have two projects that resolve the Northeast. I have some concern about Arbutus right now. In the, um, what potential. about the southeast? I, well, Sparrows Point, um, obviously the high school, middle school configuration right, is, that's is a challenge. Change, right, that's got to change. Those are the two primary areas that, that would be of concern for me. All right, thank you. Gentlemen, uh, I've heard clearly that the advantages of and the importance of prioritizing projects, and this board wants to do the best job. Today, right now, okay, you have brought forth, and correct me if I'm wrong, that there are two projects at the high school level that need immediate attention. Is that correct? The, okay. data, the data is very clear about okay. those two projects. And, yes, and, sir. And, and, and your, either your opinion would be that those two per, for, should be the, the highest priority projects as far as, as, far as high school construction. I, I would borrow from one of your colleagues who said that either of those projects 10 years from now would, would I think you would feel uh, justified in your decision. Okay. Uh, can I ask the board, what, what do we need to do in order to make those two schools the first priority? And that's not to say that the 10-year plan isn't really important and we should, we should be doing and working on that with outside experts and expertise. But we have two projects now that have been crying for solutions, you know, for, I know in Lansdowne's case for years, okay? And there's no, I haven't been to Lansdowne personally, but the stories I heard are, they're horror stories that, you know, I, you don't even believe can exist in a school. In, you know, particularly in Baltimore County, you'd be stunned that way. So I'm asking, I guess, the chair, what, what do we need to do? do? Do I need to make a motion that we prioritize these two high schools to be well, our first step? Thank you for your um, contributions and thank you for your question. What would be prudent is for the board to ask the staff, uh, well, the superintendent and the staff, to bring forward a specific recommendation to have that uh, on as an agenda item. And it would be prudent at this point to, since we're literally three weeks away from knowing key funding sources, uh, that the staff would wait to understand that. Because in addition to the high school projects that are so important, we do have elementary school projects that right now are in limbo. So we'll have a lot more information in just a few weeks. So what would be prudent is for the superintendent and staff to bring forward recommendations after understanding the results of uh, what happens in Annapolis and then what happens with the county executive and have a recommendation that's brought to the board. It's in board docs ahead of time so that we can all consider it and be prepared uh, to make a vote. Mr. Smith, this is for you. Correct me if I'm wrong. Isn't there $30 million in planning for set aside for two high schools currently that we have not prioritized? That's correct. That's correct. So, so that's something we could do today, essentially? Well, or the planning dollars are there. It's just you have to identify the projects and well, then high confer with the county. Because right. So, uh, but, but 
but, but the funding, the full funding piece is still yet to be determined, but the planning dollars, yes, are there and available, have been set aside per our discussions with the county. Yes, ma'am, it is there. And um, the next question is for Dr. Brown, and it may be something. What kind of analytical tools are you using, and are you weighing any kind of criteria on them uh, when you're doing these capacity studies? Uh, do you have some kind of constraints you're placing on them when you, you're doing, do you have a dynamic tool is what I'm asking. Uh, if you're placing some kind of constraints as in budget, time constraints, I use a tool when I'm doing mm -hmm. uh, capital infrastructure that places constraints as a software mm -hmm. in terms of, okay, there's only X amount of dollars I have and then I have to finish this before something else comes on. So is there something you guys use which would be dynamic and it would be an ever evolving tool because you know, priorities can change, but if your values, you know, you have to build certain things like schools, that's, that's an asset that you have to build that would stay constant. And maybe you don't, guys don't use it, so just this is a nerd question. We, we do. Um, I don't have the name of it right now, but we do. We have a, a tool that we use. I don't know if Pete's here. Pete. I don't want to state the name of some tool, and that's not the one we use, so. I didn't, hear, I didn't hear the question, so if you can help me. Do you have some kind of dynamic software tool you guys use for Schedule. your criteria when you're doing uh, your Plan you're out putting escalators. into weight weightage in terms of uh, how you pick these schools? Uh -huh. And are you putting any kind of limitations on them, i.e., uh, planning dollars or time to implement budget? Um, and then is it an ever-evolving tool which you kind of constantly keep changing based on tool to develop plans or tool to develop construction schedule well that's different that's a whole different <laughs> i'm not even going to bring I construction make sure I into understand it the question. No, this is for planning tool okay the planning really when we talk about planning we are talking about the size of school the design of school okay that type of thing that's what we are talking about planning so once you approve that planning should be part of the capital plan we go to state and a state doesn't fund planning, but a state has to approve planning. Once they approve planning, we have to show them enrollment projections. We have to show them the size. Uh, there is a three-step planning process. The first thing is the schematic drawing after we, after we know how many students size are there. Then we go to uh, design development, DD documents, and final phase is construction document. So the most important piece that board can do at this time is determine priority and give us the ability to apply for planning in the next CIP submission. Once you do that, then we get in a queue and we get to compete with uh, state funds from throughout the state. There are 24 LEAs that are competing for those funds. And it takes five years once with the planning is approved and construction is completed. So with the numbers that Dr. Brown just shared with you, you can imagine what will happen between now and five years. So it's in everybody's interest to uh, develop, uh, to, to, to approve planning and develop priority for that. I don't know if I answered your question no, or no, not. No, no, you did, because okay. it, it makes sense, because okay. we are competing with a bunch of counties yes. to get yes. the most bang for the buck. So it makes sense for us to put in our best projects, because there is a possibility it could be rejected at the state level yes. if they can say this shouldn't be built or just needs to be renovated. That's right. As part right. of the planning process, <laughs> and that they happens. ask for a feasibility study. And feasibility study has to prove mm -hmm. on, on a life cycle costing basis that whether replacement is more effective mm -hmm. or renovation is more effective. So even if I was to give you $100 million right now, it would be at least six to eight years before Lansdowne is built, starting from planning, design, that's construction. True. That's true. Right? Okay. Yeah. Thank you. Ms. Rowe? So in looking at our phone book here, um, is my understanding that right now uh, in the state request, we've already asked for planning approval for these um, three schools and um, our county request doesn't, doesn't ask for money for planning. So I guess my question is, what is the likelihood that if we end up in trouble with some of these other elementary schools ahead on the priority list, that the county executive or fiduciary authorities, because we have no control over the funding, will take that $30 million that 
I mean, nobody seems to even be able to tell us where it is exactly. I can't find it in allocation documents that that will somehow get reallocated to get us out of trouble with some of these elementary schools earlier on. And then if we get state planning approval, we're still using all the money the county has on these other elementary schools. I guess I'm just confused as to even if we do, even if we get the planning approval from the state, which we probably will because they kind of always do, then we still don't have the money to do the facility studies or to actually step into the process. As Mr. Smith indicated, county has committed to $30 million. Is it 30, 30, 30, million? 30, million. 30 million dollars? Was it the oh. previous county executive that did that, though? Is, where is that money? Is it still there? Because I don't see it in county documents anywhere. As, as late as last week or two weeks ago, they still maintain they that. They still that, said, yes, okay. Yes, yes, I had personal conversation with them, and they mm -hmm. said that money is there. Mm -hmm. Mr. Dixit, as we uh, move forward in considering how we're going to make decisions and when we're going to make decisions. Could you please bring something in writing to uh, address that concern that Ms. Rowe has expressed in terms of having our funding? So if um, we know in three weeks what we're going to be getting from the state, we know what we're going to be getting from the county through their um, budget address that typically happens in the second week of April, and you have that piece of information, then that would help guide your recommendations that you could bring back to the board. The piece of information that you're asking for, the $30 million available for planning. I shall do that. I'll share with the superintendent. Thank you. Are there any other questions before we conclude our work session? Mr. Kuhn. Just so I'm clear, because we've talked about planning money and getting the okay date to plan, even if we have the $30, $30 million sitting there, and if tonight we said build lands down in Towson immediately, start planning, not that we're doing that, but if, if, if that was the case, what steps do, do we have, what coordination do we need to do with the state at that moment in time to, to be able to plan? Wasn't there some kind of hoop we had to jump through or something? Well, the, the, the state, um, when, we, when the board approved to put Lansdowne, Delaney, and Towson on the capital plan, it sort of came with an asterisk that these are placeholders, right. but we're going to build something yeah. These are the placeholders. So the state, of, the state's sort of in holding to say, okay, que let us know what you're queuing up, so that we, so the the three programs we had there were just placeholders. So there, we provided the cursory information in order to make sure we're following through the process. But they were aware that our high school study, uh, capacity study, was underway. So they're they're basically saying, let us know if these projects or others are the real projects as you move forward. Uh, I, I guess, I'm sorry, I, I don't know if I was clear. My question is, is there an action that the state has to take for us to start planning? The state has to approve the planning request and the, and the information that we have included in the submission is the, in, is the information they need. Okay. Once, the, once we say go ahead, then we have to provide additional information to them. When will they say go ahead on the planning? Once the planning is approved by state, and planning cannot be approved. I'm, I'm asking you when will that happen? Well, is that like after we August or something? Or Whenever we curious. determine what, what the actual projects will be, what the, what the real projects will be to move forward for those one, two, or whatever number high schools we're going to do, that, that's when we can say, these are the projects, this is what's first, and this is what's second, and then they'll start requesting more documents related to feasibility and some of the design work that we'll need to do. All right, thank you. Yep. Thank you, gentlemen. We really appreciate all the work that you do to bring this information to us, and we look forward to all that you're going to do for us and for our students. Thank you. So thank you very much. The next item is item L, board member committee updates. And for that, I'm going to uh, start with Mr. Kuhn and then Ms. Pestur, and we'll work our way around. Okay, on uh, March 12th, 
the audit committee had a meeting. Um, we met and discussed uh, the fiscal year 19 free and reduced lunch verification results and the fiscal year 19 office of third party billing self-monitoring results. Um, and that's, that's the report. Are, are there any questions about the results? I can share them, I've got copies of them here. Okay, thank you. Ms. Pasteur for Government and Legislative and Government Relations Committee. Okay, last week uh, the Government and Legislative Committee met. Uh, Mr. Baysmore went over a number of the uh, pieces of legislation that, is, that were still uh, moving, I will say. Um, we know that uh, crossover was, what day of the week is this, Tuesday, was yesterday, started yesterday. So um, we will, in our April meeting, take a look at what actually happened this year uh, during the legislative session, and we will begin planning uh, for next year. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Pasteur. Ms. Hen, Buildings and Contracts. Yes, the Building and Contracts Committee met earlier this evening and forwarded our recommendations to the board. Thank you. For Policy Review Committee, I am chair and Mr. Offerman is my vice chair. We also have Ms. Adekoya, Ms. Pasteur, and Ms. Rowe on the committee. And I just want to say that we've been working through a tremendous amount recently, and there's been a lot of interest, so I just wanted to take a moment to share some of what we have worked on and how it's going to move through uh, the board uh, coming up. So we had two meetings since the last time we had an update because our uh, February 11th meeting got rescheduled to February 26th, uh, where we met and reviewed uh, unfinished business, discipline policy, uh, excuse me, discipline policy project. We had invited our bargaining unit representatives to come and speak to us about their suggestions uh, related to discipline. And we also had staff review the work that had previously been done on the uh, discipline policies. We also reviewed, say, 10 other policies um, and worked through those and really appreciate the work of staff in uh, getting this committee up to speed and really working through a lot of policies. Then we had a meeting on March 11th. Um, we had changed from our regular time to 11 a.m. so that board members uh, that chose to could attend the March in Annapolis for education. And again, we were able to work through a lot of um, policies. Uh, just I wanted to highlight two, policy 5550, disruptive behavior, and also policy 5560, suspensions, assignment to alternative programs or expulsions. We did approve those drafts to come forward to the full board uh, for first reader. So just to reiterate the process, when they come out to the board, they'll come out as first reader, and then second reader at a meeting, the next business meeting, uh, public will be able to comment and then we'll have an opportunity if there's a need for any amendments or uh, refinements and then a third reader in the meeting the next month in order to pass the policies, which is very important because these are critical policies for our school system and one of them is almost five years out of date and the other one is almost three years out of date. There's been a lot of um, movement in, in state regulation, so it's great that we are catching up and I appreciate staff's work in doing that. So uh, with all of that, we're going to keep the work coming. The next meeting of the Policy Review Committee will be held on April 15th, and the committee's meetings are held in this room and begin at 4.30, and they are open to the public. And that brings us to Ms. Mack. Yes, uh, Ms. Pasteur, Mr. McMillian, and I are on the Curriculum Committee, and thus far our meetings have been um, pretty much around education sessions, and I want to say that I appreciate uh, Dr. McComas and her staff for all the work that they have done to um, bring us up to speed. Our next meeting is here in this room on Thursday at 4.30, and I am eager to hear about um, the open court um, trial that took place and what the findings were and possible next steps there, but um, I do really appreciate the support that we've gotten from Dr. McComas and her staff. And Ms. Rowe, do you like to speak to your legislative task force? 
So I'm not sure it's appropriate to do that because it's not a board committee. Oh, that's but right. But would you like me to speak to it anyway? Uh, you can just state that how you're staffing and Ms. Adekoya's role. So Ms. Adekoya is the vice chair and basically where we're at with that task force right now is um, I've asked Mr. Baysmore to research what we need to do because it isn't a board committee, it's a state legislative task force. It doesn't fall under our board policies and rules, so I need guidance to proceed on this from the state legislature, which um, he and, I'm drawing a blank on her name. Care of Dr. Betoff, yes. He, he and Dr. Betoff are looking into that to make sure that we do this right. So this is the anti-bullying? The anti-bullying task force, yes. Yes, so we appreciate your work and we look forward to Ms. Adekoya giving the student voice to that, to that work. Okay, our next um, item is M information attached in, doc in board docs and also the board members have it in their information is revised superintendent's rule 5140 students enrollment and attendance assignment and or special permission transfer. There's also other items of information um, related to legislative updates and all of that is attached to board docs. The next item is item N, announcements. The only announcement is the next board meeting is Tuesday, April 9th at 6.30 here in Greenwood, Building E. And that concludes our meeting. Meeting is adjourned. Thank you, everyone.